Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Nice little uh, oak wrong side map behind me as well to illustrate that. Uh, welcome to the Global AI Student Conference today. Uh, my name's Amy Boyd. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft, uh, specializing in AI, but the actual creator of this conference is Dimitri. Dimitri, could you introduce yourself? Uh, hello, I am Dimitri. I am also a cloud advocate at Microsoft and I also teach AI in a few universities in uh, Moscow, Russia, where I am based. Fantastic. And yeah, super. Thank say thank you in the chat, everyone. Keep in touch with us. Um, say thank you to Dimitri. He's put all of this together, uh, as well as our amazing producer behind the scenes, Hank, who is another cloud advocate. So we are really bringing uh, the team with us here to take you through the day and learn lots of great new AI stuff. Um, so first of all, let's do some housekeeping, shall we? Um, so myself and Dimitri are the first up on the agenda and we're going to do a bit of an introduction as to what is AI and uh, why, why we care about that in some senses. So um, if we take a look at some of the rules, so uh, we are going to be with each other hopefully all day or as long as you can spend with us and some of the pieces of information that I wanted you to know is please uh, if you're enjoying yourself Message your friends, family, colleagues, whoever, um, and, and invite them along. Uh, see if it's interesting information for them. You can share all of your news on social media, but we would love you to hashtag with uh, GAI, so Global AI um, Student Conference, so StudConf. If you pop that hashtag on any tweet, we can also then repost it into our chat, uh, and we'd love to kind of be interacting with you all the time. Uh, if you're you're probably already there, but we obviously have our event website. Our event website has all the information you need. So we are in the player right now. But if you look just below us, uh, you'll see all of the different sessions that are coming up. And if you look, oh, this is going to be hard to do because it's like a mirror image. I think it might be this side. Uh, you'll see the chat as well. Uh, actually, no, will it be that side? No, this side. Um, and you'll see the chat. Keep in touch with us. The real value in a live event is to chat. And one thing that we're going to be able to do is myself and Dimitri are going to be hosting a lot of the sessions. And then we're going to pass over to some of our uh, expert speakers. When we get a minute with those speakers, we would love to get your questions answered. So pop them in the chat. We can get them answered. And even if we can't get them answered on the live stream because we have so much content to cover, we will get the, our, um, our speakers to spend a little bit of time in that chat making sure that they answer those questions for you. So do keep in touch with us. As with every event that we run, uh, we have a code of conduct. We want this to be a great place for everyone to come and learn and get a lot of value from. If you want to check out the code of conduct, it is at the top uh, right of our website. So if you look just above this player, you should be able to find that code of conduct. Um, do take a read through that. There is also places where you can contact us should anything go wrong. So uh, do keep that one in mind. Also, we just thought there's so many sessions, there's so much great technical content that we're going to show today, but it's the follow up that's the most important, right? It's the next steps you're going to take. So to get all of those useful links, we've put together a resources page. So if you go to aiconf.education slash resources, you'll be able to find the links for every single session that we're going to see today. So what are we going to see today? Uh, we have lots for you, but the key thing is all of these sessions are prepared for students, by students, advocates, professors and researchers. So we've got a real different set of perspectives available for you today on all sorts of different topics. So um, strap yourselves in. It's going to be a great day. We're also going to be doing things like panels. So um, should we learn AI at university or not? Uh, really interesting one, right? I, I'm not even sure I know uh, what my stance would be on that. So uh, really excited to see that panel with Lee Stott and his uh, colleagues. We're also going to start talking about the future of AI. Really interesting one. Amazing set of people that have got a lot of experience in the space and might be able to give you some key words to get you onto the latest and the greatest in the AI space. We're going to be talking a lot about ethical AI, responsible AI, privacy and AI for good. Uh, and we have some incredible people that are going to share their stories in this space. So you can see a real life uh, part of this. 
We're also going to get hands on and have some learn module walkthroughs. We're going to have lots of our student ambassadors sharing projects that they're working on. So think if you're enjoying this, it could be you next time. So keep in touch with us. Let us know what you're building. And finally, uh, we'll wrap up at the end of the day with a career panel. So should you enjoy the AI space and, and enjoy the learning that you get today, the career panel could be really, really interesting for you. Also, last but not least, we have the opportunity to win some prizes. Let me just get up all the information for you here. So we are, we've been offered some full bags of conference swag should you take part in our cloud skills challenge. So if you go to aka.ms slash AI slash challenge, you can go to this global AI student conference cloud skills challenge. The cloud skills challenge is basically the opportunity for you to go to Microsoft Learn, work through some of the modules that we've put together for you just for this event. The more you do, the higher you get on the leaderboard and the greater opportunity you have of potentially winning one of those swag bags. But don't worry, you don't have to do it all today. So we want you to stay with us. We want you to watch some of the conference pieces. You will get a week. So come back to the website on the 19th of December and hope we are hoping to publish the results on the 21st of December. Um, and we would want you to keep in contact with us. And there'll be lots of great information at aiconf.education slash challenge. OK, so we are going to be having a bit of a live demo uh, very shortly that Dimitri is going to put on for us. But I need your help out there. So what I need you to do, if you wish to be involved in us creating some live AI uh, on, on this stream, if you can go to easyfi.net slash AI comp slash drop, and if you pop a picture uh, or multiple pictures of yourself and you wish to get involved, we can actually have you take part in the demo. Um, so Dimitri is going to be doing some really cool stuff with some of our intelligent APIs. So yeah, if we want to see the magic of AI live, go to easyfi.net slash AI comp slash drop. And what, what we'll actually do is we'll pop that into the chat uh, in just a moment. OK, uh, so now let's start talking about artificial intelligence. And I think it's logical to start with a definition like what is AI? And uh, there are several definitions to that. Uh, one of them, of course, is like uh, creating intelligent computers. Uh, but also you can view AI as a, a branch of science which uh, thinks on how computers can solve problems which normally hum human beings can do better. And this is something which is called weak AI, and this is something where we can put AI to work in practice. Uh, so there are some tasks uh, at which computers are really good at. Computers are really good at computing things. When you have the steps, they can follow the steps uh, really nicely. Uh, but there are some problems for which we cannot, we do not know like the order of the steps. For example, if we want to estimate the age of a person from a photograph, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how do we as people do that. It's just we gain this uh, capability from experience after seeing a lot of people of different ages. Uh, so we cannot easily program that, but we can make computers learn this uh, by looking at examples. This is something which is called machine learning, uh, and that is something we will be talking about uh, today as well. Uh, but coming back to creating intelligent computers, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, this is actually very tricky questions on uh, how do we create something intelligent because we don't really know what intelligent means. Uh, we have some definitions of intelligent uh, um, people uh, around us, but uh, if we start thinking like, for example, is the cat intelligent? Uh, this is not an easy question because uh, in fact, many people would probably disagree on the answer. Uh, we will try to post the uh, poll uh, in the chat now so that you can uh, uh, try to express your own opinion on this. And I am pretty sure we would have like 50-50%. Uh, that is at least my experience when talking to people. Some of them, they say, of course, cat is intelligent because it can move, it can look into your eyes intelligently. Uh, but apart from that, I mean, what makes you think that uh, cat is intelligent? Um, the same thing is with computers. How do we know that we created uh, an intelligent computer? 
Well, with computer, we can at least try to talk. And uh, if we talking to computer, if we cannot distinguish computer from a human being, then of course we can uh, state that computer is intelligent because like he's indistinguishable from a human being and we know that human being is intelligent. This is something which is called Turing test. And this is uh, the first uh, and I think the most um, uh, obvious uh, definition of intelligence. Uh, throughout the history of AI, there have been many uh, attempts uh, where we try to create those talking computers. And in fact, Amy, uh, would you walk us through some of the history of AI as a field? Of course, yeah. No, so this is a really interesting one, and it's actually something that I only did very, very recently. And I highly encourage, I'm only going to give you a very brief overview. We're going to go through this pretty quickly. But I highly encourage you to go and take a look at the history of AI. Where have we come from? Because actually, there is quite a history. We think all of this is very, very new, but actually the, the term AI was coined in 1950 and it was coined at a conference. It was called the Dartmouth Summer Research Project Conference. Um, and one of the people you may have heard, heard of his name in this space is John McCarthy. And he was someone that said, uh, there's an actual quote where he says, to proceed on the basis that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can simulate it. So this was the idea back in 1950 of exactly what AI was going to be. They had a lot of very smart people in one room that got together and kind of started to talk a bit about what they thought AI was. And in the 1950s, it was very much this kind of initial idea. And again, the Turing test that Dimitri mentioned, a really fascinating one. Again, a very famous name, Alan Turing. He speculated about the possibilities that creating machines that can think um, that's very broad, right? And I think even now, I think, um, I'm not sure whether, whether we can say machines think, but we're maybe starting to make the form of intelligence or what is deemed to look like intelligence. And this is something that I just want to leave with you from 1950 all the way up to where, where we are today. One of the key things is that the the expectation of AI changes across all of this uh, history, right? So even back in 1950, right, the expectation was maybe a lot less than what we see today. But realistically, we're still trying to create this idea of what does it mean to be intelligent uh, and to look and to look like you're intelligent. Some of the first pieces were the laws of robotics. You might have seen films that have things like the three laws of robotics in and also things like chess playing, um, strategy games, stuff like that. Games was one of the first pieces. And actually, as we progressed into 1960, there was even things like Eliza, the talking bot. Now, Eliza came in many forms. Um, interestingly, the form I initially heard of was a psychologist. Eliza was um, a, a conversational AI agent, we'll come back to that in a minute, um, that actually was able to speak with people. But realistically, behind the scenes, what it was doing at the time was maybe not as intelligent as we would expect right now. But the idea that in 1960, we were talking about conversational AI, and actually even today, in some of the learn modules that we're going to walk through, we're going to create chatbots. So that was Oh my goodness, that was 60 years ago. 60 years ago, this stuff is not new, but we are progressing all the time. There was also things like um, Shaky. Shaky was a robot, a physical robot, that was able to understand and place blocks and do tasks. Um, it was a very much um, an idea of being quite structured intelligence. But it was an interesting idea if we could say that actually what we've progressed into now and you could think of something like reinforcement learning is a massive progression on what shaky was able to do at the time but it wasn't all great right there was this gold rush in the 50s and 60s we call it where um many many industries were plummeting money into ai research and that was when people were getting excited but as with anything when we get excited and we maybe don't see the results we expect we actually end up running into something called the ai winter and this was because funding ceased, optimism was really low because raised expectations were not met. And one of the things that, that actually happened was super critical feedback. Things like Eliza, people were saying, actually, is this ethically correct that we're telling, uh, we're, we're saying that this is a psychologist? Should people know that this is a bot? 
Um, there was a lot about the infrastructure and, and pieces that it ran on as well. And so, yeah, the AI winter meant that funding ceased, huge programs of promises uh, were maybe not met. But one interesting thing that happened there was Scruffy versus Neat AI. Scruffy AI was this idea by Marvin Minsk, um, who, again, was a very popular person in the space. And he actually said, Scruffy versus Neat, there is this idea that if you know what a bird is, you could say that a bird has a beak or it has wings or it has feathers. And there's all these different elements about a bird that you can assume. But this was considered quite scruffy, whereas neat AI was considered a more step by step process to something, tree decision making and pieces like that. And this was the battle of scruffy versus neat as to which direction would make more sense. Now, actually, in the 80s, expert systems, so knowledge based systems, if this happens, then next step is this, then next step is this, then next step is this. They were super popular. They actually made it into businesses and became really, really great in the space. But only businesses that could afford this incredibly expensive infrastructure. Uh, and unfortunately, that let itself down a little bit because it wasn't usable by everyone. Uh, and so we actually went into a very slightly little and a second low, a second AI winter very briefly there. But the revival of connectionism happens. Now, connectionism, we now know as neural networks in most cases. And connectionism was this idea that we had to approach these problems from a very different perspective. And hopefully in our uh, future panel, we might talk a little bit about, are we running down the right routes and stuff like that? Or do we always want to be lo looking for another local maximum in some senses? Um, as I said, did we ask too much? We started to get a little bit of a lull again in AI. Things weren't quite what happened, but the semantic web happens. The, the search engines change the world, right? They change everything that we know about AI. And I think search engines were fascinating for their time. Um, they were one, probably one that, in my mind, they were probably one of the first production use cases of AI. Um, uh, and we use it on a daily basis. And it's so, I mean, what it was in 1990 is not even, uh, sorry, sort of late, slightly later 90s is not what it is today. Obviously, it's progressed hugely, but um, realistically, a fascinating uh, initial research. When we start moving into the 2000s, there was a time where everything had to have a face. So people were getting concerned that AI wasn't personable enough almost. If, you, if we needed someone to, to be intelligent, then it had to have a face because we deem ourselves intelligent. Um, and actually, we'll see the vote. But did you deem a cat intelligent, for example? Is it something you can empathize with? Is it something you can work with easier because it, it kind of has a face? Um, and so we can start then looking at things like self-driving cars, some of the initial thoughts around them, as well as I wanted to add in Roomba, the, uh, the little Hoover robot is a fascinating one. In one of my um, lectures around robotics when I was at university, uh, my lecturer um, brought in a Roomba and just let it start like hoovering the floor at the bottom of the lecture. And we were all like, what is going on? But his purpose was that robotics didn't need a face necessarily, but it's interesting that when you put eyes on something, how that changes your perspective of it. Now, we're in the 2000s, things are really progressing, but probably more closer to home, things we remember and maybe still use on a daily basis. You start to get into the 2010s, where we heard a lot from IBM Watson when it won the Jeopardy uh, quiz game, which was really fascinating. It's kind of general use of knowledge. But also we started to see those voice assistants. So did Eliza and our conversational AI progress over 50 years? And now we were speaking to computers, not just interacting with them via a keyboard. And so all the voice assistants from Google, Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, uh, really started to hit the market. One of the really interesting pieces is uh, as we got into sort of past 2014, so maybe the, the sort of more distant past, um, we saw, again, loads of extra things. Alexa became very popular. AlphaGo was a real um, sort of push in the right direction in AI. We also got to human parity. Now, Keep this one in mind, human parity does not necessarily mean it's perfect because we actually make mistakes as humans, 
but we got to human parity and image recognition and voice recognition through research data sets, which was a, a really, you know, incredible way because, you know, it was one of those ones, there's always that joke video, isn't there, of people standing in a lift trying to talk to it and it can't understand them and stuff like that. These, all these things were progressing. AI, though, did get broken into subfields. The word AI maybe started to be not overused, but it started to be very, like, it means a lot at this point because there's so many different broken subfields. So what you might hear from people, for example, some of our experts, they specialise in natural language processing or they specialise in audio or they specialise in certain different subfields. So keep that in mind as you're going and learning about AI. But Dimitri, I wanted to bring you in here because can you tell us a little bit more about Eugene Guzman and what, what that actually means, why I put it on here? Right. Yeah. Actually, uh, a few years ago, there uh, were a uh, paper like in, in the news, there were articles saying that uh, Turing test has been passed. And uh, uh, this story, uh, in fact, uh, happened uh, when uh, there was a bot called Eugene Gustman presented by a team of uh, Russian researchers. And I had a chance to meet one of them, Sergei Ulayson, who was the person behind this uh, team. And uh, uh, he told me how they tried to approach the Turing test. Uh, they created a bot which mimicked the behavior of 14 year old boy with mental problems. And uh, so the bot, when people started chatting with him, he said up front that, uh, you know, I am a 14 year old boy and I have mental problems. So if I say something abnormal, don't pay attention. I mean, that's me, that's how I am. And this tricked uh, some people to believe that it is actually a human being behind this bot and not uh, an artificial intelligence. And that's why uh, there were certain judges who uh, said that this is a human being. And um, it, this was a news that Turing test has been passed. But I think this is not exactly the case because, uh, of course, if we put a lot of people into talking to this uh, bot, it would be clear that that is not the level of human intelligence that we are looking for. Um, so uh, at this moment, I don't think we can say that Turing test uh, is over and we have the intelligent machines which are behaving exactly like human beings. Uh, so let's uh, maybe talk a little bit more like how can we approach uh, creating those intelligent machines. And because we know that people are intelligent, we have two ways uh, to uh, try to uh, re represent the same behavior. We can try to uh, figure out how we are thinking, right? Uh, because uh, probably most people think in the same or at least the similar way. We have some kind of logic behind our actions, behind our thoughts, and we can try to uh, extract this knowledge from people represented somehow in the computer readable and computer processable form and build our intelligence system on top of that. It is something which is called symbolic reasoning. Uh, it is the technology behind expert systems uh, and a lot of other uh, AI projects, especially in the first uh, uh, part of AI history. Uh, so this is also called a uh, top-down approach because we look in, into ourselves. We try to figure out how are we thinking and we try to represent this inside the computer. We can also go the other way. We can uh, use the bottom-up approach uh, because we know more or less how our brain works. We know that our brain con consists of neuron cells which are connected to each other, which exchange electrical signals. So we can build the model of our brain inside the computer and we can try to teach it uh, by some examples, like in the same way as the person, newly born person learns by interacting with the environment. Uh, so this technology, for example, uh, neural networks is very e efficient for doing uh, image classification. Like if you want to tell a cat uh, from a dog, from a picture, uh, this is exactly a, a very good example of um, use for neural networks because we can find a lot of labeled examples and the uh, neural network will learn from those examples. Uh, and uh, this is something which happens also with us. We cannot say how do we uh, tell a, a, the cat from a dog. This just happens inside our brain. Uh, so those two approaches, they are kind of uh, complementary to each other. Uh, it happened that symbolic approach was very popular in the beginning of AI history. And then at some point when revival of connectionism happened, um, well, this happened uh, for several reasons. Uh, more powerful computers became available, more data became available on the internet. So this led us to the very uh, huge successes of AI, I think starting something like 2010. Uh, this approach became uh, pervasive. So 
But if we look at the real life systems, like uh, if we consider a voice assistant like uh, Cortana or uh, 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 Alexa, they are built using both pieces of technology. Neural networks are used to recognize our voice and to figure out the intent of a person, uh, what we want actually the assistant to do. But then once uh, it knows like uh, what we want to do, the, the further actions, they are triggered by algorithms or by some knowledge representation. Uh, so we have those uh, systems uh, which mimic the behavior of a human being. In our brain also, the speech recognition happens somehow without our consciously understanding that, uh, somehow automatically, and then we switch to reasoning. Uh, one of the uh, projects I want to uh, talk about is uh, the project I took part in. Uh, it's uh, uh, Intelligent Robotic Pillow. So we were building with uh, some students and with a company called Mechanium, uh, a robotic pillow which can stand like uh, at the entrance to some exhibition and it would interact with people. Uh, as soon as it sees a person in front of it, it will figure out its uh, age, emotions uh, and start reacting accordingly. So this uh, image processing is powered by uh, neural networks and it happens in the cloud. Uh, then uh, the facts that I extracted from the photographs are inserted into the rule-based engine and rule-based engine starts reasoning. Like if he sees the person who is sad and the person is young, he will tell some kind of uh, a joke for suitable for young people. And if the person is old, it will probably uh, take the different path of the dialogue. Uh, so this combination allows us to achieve behavior which is seemingly intelligent. And the interesting thing is that this pillow also had the reactive brain. Uh, so if somebody appeared, uh, it takes a few seconds to uh, actually see the picture and do the uh, trip to the cloud and back. Uh, but even before that, the pillow somehow reacted. So it like shakes when it sees somebody uh, or smiles uh, using this LED. So this reactive brain was powered by one uh, microcontroller, Arduino, and then the reasoning brain powered by Raspberry Pi, and all those things together with the cloud working together to create one intelligent behavior. So this is an example of um, approach where both uh, types of artificial intelligence uh, were used. Fantastic. And thank you, Dimitri, for that great explanation of symbolic versus neural AI and kind of where that sits in history, uh, where that kind of change really started to see and where we see that now in some um, different projects that we're seeing. So um, if you want to know more about Symbolic Meets Neural AI, the state of the art and the future of AI, in about, uh, just looking at my clock, three hours, so about halfway through this event, we're going to have the opportunity to speak with Mikhail, Sergey, and Grigori. Uh, Dimitri's going to be taking on that, and he's going to be asking them to provide their opinions and their questions um, about the state of the art and the future of AI. So do keep tuned. Make sure you're asking your questions of these amazing experts that we were able to secure for today. So... We've talked there about the history of AI. We've talked about these different types of AI. There's loads going on in this space. Like, um, again, we've got that resources page on the website. So the website you're on, there's a resources page. Um, you can get all of the links for the things we've covered. But I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about something that's an easy step into AI. So AI depends on a lot of data. Data fuels machine learning um, and AI systems. So we often have to then think about, okay, do we build the AI ourselves or do we buy the AI? Because, uh, which sounds like really odd, so let me break that down for you. So when you um, build it, you have to obviously have a lot of data to train it. Uh, you have to choose the algorithms. You have to do a lot of experimentation. You probably have to then try and deploy it somewhere and maintain it and retrain it, uh, which is great, right? If you have a really bespoke solution that you're trying to build. However, we are starting to see within the tech industry the democratization of AI, the ability to actually buy AI services. So the ability to get a service um, and actually call it by an API and get intelligence back without having to build the algorithm yourself. And so one example of this is the Azure Cognitive Services. These are a set of pre-trained models that sit in the cloud as well as on the edge now as well in containers. Um, and what they do are they are already trained by pro technology providers like Microsoft to do different things. So we have different categories such as vision, speech, language, and knowledge. So if we think of vision, 
I might think about computer vision options. So what is in the image? Who is in the image? Um, what different features are in the image? Maybe I can even do a happy medium, something called transfer learning, where actually I build on top of a model uh, and, and personalize it more. We talked a little bit about those um, research boundaries that we've met uh, within sort of after 2014 on sort of image recognition and speech recognition. And so we have speech APIs, the ability for you to translate from speech to text, text to speech, translate into different languages, et cetera, um, leading us on to our, our language piece. If you're building conversational AI, the language systems are incredible at doing things like Q&A, or we have something called the language understanding service. And then finally, we have knowledge and decision on the end where we're really starting to build out things like anomaly detection algorithms. And as I said, all of these different things, you don't have to build yourself. You potentially need a lot less data. There's a lot less maintenance. We, we kind of deal with that as a service provider. And what you do is you call off with a HTTP request and you get back the intelligence. And from there, it's then what you do with these APIs, how you pull them all together that makes them very interesting. So um, one example is the face API, which does face detection and description as well as person identification. One of the um, a really, really nice example is Hank. Hank is actually our producer for today. So uh, say thank you in the chat for Hank for producing this amazing conference. But Hank was using the Face API. So as you can see, um, he has a sort of a bounding box that's gone around his face. So it's identified that there's a face in the image. It's got lots of different dots on it, as well as sort of an inner boundary. And so if we take a look, what do all these dots mean? Well, we have things like age, gender, is, is Hank smiling in this? Uh, what type of hair or, or facial hair or makeup is on there? But then on the other side, we can also even start to extend that and we look at things like emotions. Is Hank smiling? So it's saying he is pretty happy at 83%. We're pretty sure he's happy in this picture. And then there's a set of neutral and a bit of content as well. And then at the bottom, things about kind of the actual picture itself. So is there a bit of a blur? What's the, uh, the light like? Um, and what is the head pose? So are you kind of looking slightly off camera? Has it picked up your face correctly, et cetera? So there's loads of great information. And the idea is you don't necessarily have to use it all, but it's available for you to actually extract and then use for what you see as the right purpose. Now, with any of these APIs, you are not necessarily building them, but you are leveraging them and using them in your applications. And so it's incredibly important to live via ethical principles as well. So AI is very, very powerful, um, but do always consider how you are using it in your products. Um, so, for example, with face recognition, Microsoft is adop adopting facial recognition principles, uh, things like fairness, transparency, accountability, non-discrimination, notice and consent, and lawful surveillance. So these are specific things. Uh, if you search for the Microsoft facial recognition principles and a search engine, you can read a little bit more about them. We're also going to have the opportunity to speak with uh, a couple of different people who are going to talk more about ethics and responsible AI. So we have Alexia, she's going to tell her story on bias and privacy. Um, and then we're also going to hear from Rishit, who's going to be talking about teaching your models to play fair, which is going to be a great, uh, great session. Okay, so now uh, let me show you uh, one example of how those cognitive services can be used. And I hope you took advantage and uploaded your photograph using the link provided. And if uh, you haven't done that, you have uh, uh, something like 30 seconds to do that. So what we will be doing uh, now is using cognitive services to uh, create a piece of uh, science art like this. Um, this photograph is obtained by uh, taking several uh, photographs and aligning them together in a certain way. So we can use cognitive services to uh, find out those facial landmarks, the red dots you've seen in the uh, image previously. And then uh, we can use those landmarks to align images using uh, the mathematical concept of affine transformation, uh, which means uh, pretty much uh, moving the image, uh, stretching it, zooming in the right way. So affine transformation can be defined by three points. So we need to specify three points on the face. I will take, uh, for example, two eyes and then some point in the middle of the mouth. And I would uh, 
uh, find out the transformation which moves uh, them exactly in the right places in the final picture. And then we'll just mix all the pictures together. So in order to do that, uh, there is uh, a code uh, that I put on the GitHub. Uh, you can uh, go there yourself and uh, run this code later on after the conference. Uh, actually, creating this kind of portrait, which I called cognitive portrait, is a nice uh, uh, Christmas present. You can do that for your friends by taking uh, a bunch of photographs from them and creating this kind of averaged out face. So let me show you how um, uh, this uh, GitHub repository uh, looks. So you have here uh, a lot of uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, in Python, uh, each one corresponding to different technique of uh, using cognitive services to produce a different result. So here are the examples of uh, different portraits that uh, I created or some of uh, other people created because uh, I have some contributors to this repository. Uh, some of them are my students, some of them are just people who uh, walked by. So I encourage you, if you want to play with it a little bit more, to create your own way, interesting way of aligning the photographs uh, based on facial landmarks. So in order to run this, uh, if you have um, uh, GitHub um, code spaces. This is a new uh, technology which is now in beta in GitHub. Uh, if you have it enabled, you can open this repository right here uh, on the GitHub and immediately start uh, playing with the code. Uh, if you don't have it, you can either use a uh, binder, click here, and it would launch uh, in a few minutes a Jupyter notebook. Or even better, you can open this repository locally on your computer in Visual Studio Code and um, uh, run this code locally, but you would need to have uh, Python uh, installed in order to do that. Uh, that's what I will do. I have this repository already open on my computer, and I will play with the notebook called Cognitive Portrait.ipnb, which is the main notebook which contains step by step description of all the code. So if you open it later on, uh, the code is pretty much self explanatory, it contains the description of what's going on. Uh, but I will go quickly through uh, different parts. Uh, first of all, it installs some of the libraries, like in particular, we need OpenCV for image manipulation. Um, and we also need the Microsoft Cognitive Services SDK, Azure SDK library, uh, to call the cognitive service. Uh, after, after you do that, you also need some uh, key, the, the, the um, uh, key and endpoint URL to the cognitive service in order to run it. Uh, because cognitive services involve uh, some computations done in the cloud, this is not completely free service. It costs money. But uh, what you can do, if you have Azure subscription, then you just create the cognitive service in your subscription and you get the key and the URL. Uh, if uh, you don't have Azure subscription, uh, if you're a student, you are lucky, you can uh, get Azure subscription uh, for free uh, if you verify your student status. Um, and then you can create cognitive services uh, if not, you can either create trial subscription or you can just get the trial key to the cognitive service, which would be valid for one week. And one week is probably enough to make New Year and Christmas presents for, your, for all your friends. So to get the trial key, there is a link here. You can just click on it and uh, you only need your Microsoft account. You want to say you want to get the API key. Uh, click here and you would get uh, the key. So then uh, this key you need to paste here, uh, the key and the endpoint. Uh, you need to make sure to remove some trailing things from the endpoint, just leaving the server name here. Uh, and after that, uh, we can call cognitive services just uh, by line, one line of code. So here, for example, I take the URL of a picture. This picture is uh, actually, if we open it in the browser, it's um, uh, the picture like this, my photograph. Uh, located somewhere on the web. And then I call uh, detect with URL. I provide the URL and I say, what do I want to get uh, as a result? In this case, I want to get the age. And it will give me the age, 41, which is pretty accurate. Uh, so now you would need uh, to get a bunch of images. And uh, that is exactly what we asked you to upload images for. So let me go to my Dropbox and see if we have some images from people. And in fact, yeah, we do have some images. So let me uh, select all of them and download somewhere on my computer. Uh, now I will extract them somewhere. Uh, I will instruct them directly in the correct directory. So Global AI Student Conference. Let me actually say just stay stood conf. 
and uh, I should see them. Yeah, here they are, stud.conf and the, the images that you have provided. So now I will specify this name of the directory in the code. And let me just take the first image and see how cognitive services uh, work with it. You see those red dots? Those red dots were automatically extracted by the call to the cognitive services and plotted over the image. This is just to uh, convince you that it actually works and this is not magic pre-programmed by us uh, before. Now uh, we just go through all images one by one. We call cognitive services and extract uh, their facial landmarks. Uh, this will take a little bit of time depending on how many pictures do we have. Um, and uh, then just to make sure, here are the coordinates uh, for the first picture. You see that we have the landmark name, X and Y coordinates. Now we can just plot the images to see how they look. Um, those are original images, and I put some of my photographs and photograph of my daughter there as well, just because I want to get involved in this uh, cognitive portrait uh, of all of us together. So then uh, to do the, the fine transformation, that's pretty simple. We just need two calls uh, to OpenCV, get a fine transform. We pass in the source coordinates of the points, left pupil, right pupil, and the middle of the mouth. And we transfer them, transfer them into the predefined coordinates. Target triangle are the predefined coordinates, hard coded, where I want eyes and the middle of the mouse to be in the final picture. And then Warpafine does the actual transformation to the image. So if we uh, do that to all our images, uh, you see that uh, they all are aligned now in the proper way. Head is exactly in the same position. So the only thing we need to do is to mix all of that together to produce the result. Uh, and to mix all of them together, I have the small function here. We do the merge, and here is the portrait that uh, we have created. The average uh, face of a person watching uh, this uh, conference. Uh, and you can save it later on, so I will not do it, but you can uh, run this code. Uh, you can take your own pictures, you can mix together pictures of different people and achieve uh, different results. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things I did, I took, for example, photographs of my daughter. Uh, I sorted it automatically into different groups according to the age and aligned in this way so that you can see it goes from youngest to the oldest. So it's called growing up. It represents how she grew up uh, uh, eventually. So I think this is nice uh, uh, piece of art which has the idea behind it and which uh, used artificial intelligence to uh, put it all together automatically. So. Uh, use this code, uh, and if you create some photographs as part of this conference, you can use the same link, easyfi.net slash icon slash drop, to share with us the results. We would love to see them. Uh, and uh, if you create a new technique, like if you uh, come up with a nice way to align pictures based on the facial landmarks, uh, definitely do a pull request to this repository. I would be really happy to see that. So as a takeaway, uh, we saw that AI can be a great assistant to a human being uh, in any area, including those kind of uh, creating artistic things. And we need to learn Python. To do uh, a lot of AI, you need Python, and probably you also need something else. You also want to learn the, the, the mathematics behind it. If you want to uh, create your own algorithms uh, and do some breakthroughs, of course, you also need uh, some uh, basic knowledge of uh, math. And that's, that was such a great demo. Thank you everyone for getting involved um, and Dimitri, well done for putting all that together. Great live demo and it, and it went really well. Good stuff. Um, so the um, speaking of learning, right? So we've talked about so many different things, but there is going to be a round table today where we've got a load of different perspectives from different academics and people within the field um, that are going to talk a little bit about do you need to go to university to master AI and machine learning with online courses, with academia, do you do both? Uh, so Lee Stott, um, our, one of our principal program managers here at Microsoft, is going to be leading that panel and talking to a variety of different perspectives uh, on, on what that looks like. So stick with us. Uh, we'll hear from them later in the day. So, uh, Dimitri, you have shown that we can do a lot of different things with AI and actually using the, the data and combining it. And you, you showed art. That was incredible. Um, but is there a limit to what AI can do? Uh, let me actually take this art as an example. So in this uh, cognitive portrait uh, example, we've been using AI to align images, but uh, we had the idea of how we want them aligned. 
but in fact uh, nowadays you can train neural networks to create art by themselves like almost by themselves uh, we can show the neural network a lot of uh, pieces of art a lot of portraits in this case uh, or a lot of pictures of flowers or landscapes and it will produce those kind of uh, artificial paintings and it looks like ai became creative it looks like ai can do things by itself and whether it's true or not, I will not go into detailed discussion now. Uh, I encourage you to visit my uh, blog and to read more about it and about the technique behind it called generative adversarial networks. And this this is something we are not talking a lot today, but maybe if we do this conference next time, we will dedicate a different, definitely a talk to that. Uh, but um, the main thing here is that uh, when we train a neural network, we essentially ask a computer to do some random combination of uh, patterns that it extracted from the images. So it can definitely extract patterns. It can understand how the human face would look like in a portrait, how flowers would be composed of different uh, um, different artifacts, but it doesn't have the goal. I mean, it doesn't understand that it's creating flowers. It doesn't uh, want to create flowers. Uh, so what's actually happening here is that we ask AI to produce a random combination and then we use it as a result. So uh, such work can be viewed as the joint work by a human being and artificial intelligence. And that is something I think uh, which is applicable to a lot of different uh, areas. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great point, Dimitri, that it's it's kind of human and AI, right? We, we are a huge element of what we are building. And interestingly, I had the opportunity to take, uh, to, to watch a, a talk that happened, um, an ethical AI talk, and it just took a very different perspective. And so I, I kind of wanted to share with you very briefly um, a short use case that was used in this in this session. If you want to read more detail about this, go to aka.ms slash ethical dash AI dash questions. And I wrote a whole blog post there kind of illustrating some of my thinking. But the key thing is, would you trust an AI too? And so we're going to go through a couple of little samples and then uh, I'm going to show you a framework that I thought was fascinating. So would you trust an AI to recommend your product or service? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I would, right? We're used to that. Think about all your favorite online e-commerce sites. If you buy this, others like you bought this. Yeah, that's pretty good recommendation. Sometimes it's not quite right, but it's not the end of the world. It's not too intrusive. Happy for an AI to do it. Okay, would you trust an AI to keep you safe online? Well, I, I know um, there's lots of interesting things happening in the security space with AI. And if there's anything that can help me keep safe online and, and it's smart enough to figure out patterns, I'm not an expert in that space. So, yeah, I, I would I would say I'm happy for it to keep me safe online. OK, would you um, uh, allow an AI to would you trust an AI to assist your driving? OK, this one's an interesting one, right, because we're in control of a car. Yeah, I think assist. I think the word assist is comfortable enough for me. I know we have car, many, many cars out there now that are starting to do this kind of thing where they keep you away from people or they help you park. I'm not very good at parking a car, so maybe I would want, I would trust it to do that better than I would. OK, so that's an interesting one. I hope you're answering these questions yourself as well. OK, so next one, would you trust an AI to drive you? OK, we're, we're relinquishing a little bit more control there. So it's not just assisting, it's going to drive you. But we know that there's brands out there who are doing self-driving cars. We spoke about it in the history of AI. Uh, you know, how long ago those first self-driving cars were happening. Um, and, you know, it's, it's got a lot of data. And as long as you have something where, where you can intervene, I think I would... Yeah, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. I've not actually done, I've not been in a self-driving car myself. So uh, that would be an interesting one. But yeah, I hope you're forming your own opinions. Okay, would you trust an AI to monitor your health? Uh, I don't have it on today, but I do actually have a fitness band and that kind of tells me a lot of data and often tells me when I'm too dehydrated, go and get a glass of water, or especially when I'm sitting at my desk all day, it'll tell me to get up and move around. Yeah, yeah, monitor my health. Okay, I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, would you trust an AI to dispense medication? Okay, maybe we're seeing a pattern here with me, but control is a thing that I quite like. And so I, I start to get a bit cynical sometimes. And I'm like, oh, but, but what if it goes wrong? Like how 
is there a way that I know what it's doing? Um, yeah, that's an interesting one, right? Okay, so what's the next one? Would you trust an AI to help you choose a babysitter? Okay, this one's a much more personal one, right? Like if you, it, you know, one the most precious thing in your life, maybe that um, that you're you're you know, you're you're in full look after mode of. That's a really interesting one. Not one you would think that people would jump into AI for. So um, so let's take a look at, there was this interesting idea that um, uh, there's a use case that would you trust an AI to choose you a babysitter now? And it could go off and it could look at social media data about a babysitter and it could start to analyze different profiles and maybe it could help you choose what you think is important for you, a bit like a recommendation engine, right? We We maybe said it was okay for retail, but do we feel like it's okay for choosing um, a babysitter? And one of the interesting pieces, do read more about that case study in that article, but it actually then boils down to something called the FATE framework, fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethical AI. And one of the fascinating things about this conversation at this conference was some of the questions that people proposed that we should ask ourselves when we're building a project. So let's take a look at some of those questions. So. Uh, things like under fairness, is an, is anyone treated differently? So in the case of a babysitter, if we're scraping social media data and this babysitter is maybe someone who's um, of an older generation and doesn't use social media uh, a lot, does that actually work against them? Um, because they're, they're, you know, they're not as engaged in that population, they're a different type of person. Is the training data relevant or um, representative? Um, is there systems in place to address this this you know potential unfairness that sits in there what about accountability one of the things i kept saying wasn't it was was that control piece relinquishing control um and actually what happens for accountability as humans we're very accountable so we should be asking our questions when we're doing ai projects like is there a human that's ultimately accountable? Is there um, a mechanism for feedback or to challenge a result that's coming back, especially in the, the area of are you picked for a job, for example? I mean, you know, is there an opportunity to challenge and ask more about why that result happened? Moving on to transparency, is it clear that this is being done by an AI? Or do, do people think it's a human that sits behind the scenes and makes these decisions? All these things should be clear, understood and well described as you're building these AI um, solutions with, with these different technologies. Are some of the limitations clear? We know technology is not perfect, right? And AI isn't perfect. It's a, it's a probability sometimes. Um, so are we honest when we're building these about what, what limitations are in the solution and are we sharing that and being transparent? If we move on to ethical, are there societal in implications? Does this only treat to one part of society or does it you know, not help another part? Um, is it not available in some parts of society? Uh, are there protections or is there human monitoring? Is there someone that's saying, you know, I'm a keeping control? Um, are there lives that are impacted? And I just found this framework really, really interesting to understand the, some of the questions, some of the actions I can take, because I think a lot of ethical AI talks tend to be, this has gone wrong and this has gone wrong and this has gone wrong. This one felt felt good to me as, as someone who builds an AI solution that I can start asking some of these questions and I can continue my journey into responsible AI. Speaking of continuing that journey, if you want to learn any more, all of these links are on the resource page. One of my favorite ever responsible AI talks is the trouble with bias, that top one. Um, it was at a keynote at a research conference, and it was just the most fascinating talk by an amazing lady named Kate Crawford. Um, and if you get a chance, please watch that great watch. There is lots of great resources from Microsoft uh, that we released at Microsoft Build in May. There's also something called the AI Now Institution that is not a, a Microsoft uh, piece, but I read sometimes their report. They do a yearly report that talks about what's happened with AI in the year. You can read more about all of this kind of um, framework at the ethical questions idea, and you can check out the learn and the docs opportunities. So we talked a bit about ethical AI, we talked a bit about some of the technical side of pieces, but this idea of democratizing AI, making AI available, allowing you to build um, 
all of these different solutions that you envision and allow you to be innovative. AI doesn't just stay with technical people. We're talking about these really broad questions, right? And, and businesses are an important part of making these decisions and understanding the impact. And so um, if yourself, if you're interested, or if other people around you that you're working with would be interested in taking a look at the AI Business School, you can go to this link just here. So aka.ms slash AI Bus School. Um, and this is in partnership with one of the most amazing business schools in the world. Um, and they've created some great content for you to learn from as well. So we're going to look at the technical approach in this conference. There is a great business perspective to be learned as well. So now uh, let's a little bit mention the technical things because we talked about cognitive services and this is only one part of our AI story. Uh, it uh, sits on the top of everything because they are easy to use pre-trained models. But of course you can also do uh, all stages of uh, developing AI models inside Microsoft Cloud. Uh, it all starts with the great foundation. We have uh, great processing powers, in, uh, CPU, GPU, and FPGAs uh, powering uh, all the AI innovations. And then uh, on top of that, you can uh, use several uh, things. You can use uh, virtual machines to train your mach Azure models, uh, or you can use Azure Machine Learning or Azure Databricks. Uh, so let me briefly mention uh, those possibilities to you. So uh, first approach, which is like the simplest one to start, if you used to train your models locally, as a data scientist, you can use the data science virtual machine, which is essentially you create a virtual machine for the time you need, and you use it for training your models. And you can access that either using SSH, a virtual desktop, or using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, however, this is not the best way because uh, uh, HVM is uh, something which is you have to manually control, you have to start it, you have to stop it. Uh, there is a specific technology called Asian Machine Learning. And Asian Machine Learning is uh, a lot of things. It uh, brings everything you need to train your models, deploy your models uh, into one uh, piece of technology. Uh, so there are some uh, technologies that can be used by beginners. So for example, if you don't know a lot about machine learning, you can use AutoML or you can use graphical tool called designer uh, to design your models without any programming experience. Uh, or on the other hand, if you are a very advanced uh, data scientist and you want to use uh, clusters to automatically train your models in parallel or train a lot of uh, different combinations of, of hyperparameters and optimize them, all that you can also do with Azure Machine Learning. Uh, I will not, uh, do not have time to go into much details. Uh, there is a set of resources if you want watching there, if you like watching the videos, uh, there is a great set of videos on Azure ML and on Azure in general uh, at this URL. You can read that, uh, you can read the blog post series, uh, you can follow a tutorial on GitHub, or there is definitely a great learn module to do that as well. Uh, all those links are available at our resources page, so go and explore them uh, if you have time. And finally, Databricks, a technology for uh, big data. There would be a separate talk today on uh, uh, Databricks and Apache Spark, and I encourage you to uh, uh, attend this talk as well. Amazing. So yeah, we have loads of great technical talks coming up, but we also spoke about the career options here. So it, we have just done a very quick overview of many, many different areas that we're going to deep dive into during the sessions. But realistically, if you want to stay at the, towards the end of the day, we are actually going to be talking about how you can skyrocket your career in the space of AI. And we're going to have lots and lots of great different people that are going to look um, at what's happening in the space and how, what they've done to access their career. OK, so um, we are at the end of our session. So we've spent a little bit of time covering kind of all the different areas, a bit of history, a bit of responsible AI, a bit of technical. Um, and we are actually going to dive straight into um, our next sessions where we're going to deep dive into some of those areas. We hope you enjoy the rest of the day. You're going to be hearing from me and Dimitri throughout the day as we um, start to uh, basically introduce lots of our different speakers but what we're going to do is if you want to find any links at all that we mention they are available on the resources page so go to aiconf.education slash resources and don't forget that ai cloud skills challenge if you go to aka.ms slash ai slash challenge you can actually go ahead and get started on there and so without further ado i'd like to introduce our next speaker so um I would like to introduce Ananya. Then 